Yeah, well, hello, everyone. Um, I recognize a few names there. Um, so this presentation is a joint joint one by by uh, me, and I'll be starting it uh, in, a, in a few seconds. Um, I'm Tim Powell from the, the National Archives. I'll say a little more about that um, in the presentation. And my uh, co-presenter is Lucy. Uh, evening, everyone. Yes, um, so I'm Lucy Bonner, and I am the archivist for the Institution of Mechanical Engineers uh, based in Westminster in London. Um, yeah, and I will be doing the sort of second part of the presentation. Super. I will now um, share my screen. Right, so um, this evening's presentation is uh, Taking Flight, the Aviation and Aerospace Archives Initiative. So um, the Aviation and Aerospace Archives Initiative, uh, initiative uh, formally began in November 2018 with a meeting at um, <clears throat> Leonardo, formerly Westland, helicopters at Yeovilton. Um, it was a small meeting with the invited participants and it was really to gauge the level of interest and, and, and enthusiasm for um, a program to address uh, aspects of, of archives relating to, to aviation. Um, it was at that stage, it was pretty open. We didn't know uh, what interest there would be. We didn't know what people would like to see um, done. We, it may be that, that everyone who turned up said, oh, no, there's no problem at all. Um, we're fine, thank you. Um, and there was the, the moment when, when everyone had stopped talking and we were sitting around the table and, 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 uh, and then everyone sort of looked at me um, to, start to, to start talking. To, talking to them about about why they were there. Um, as it turned out, uh, there was a lot of a lot of interest there and a lot of enthusiasm uh, for for pushing forward. There were some interesting questions about, um, okay, um, you've called us all here. Um, can you give us some sort of idea of of what you see the future being? And then we'll we'll comment on that. Um, it was all positive and constructive. Um, and so from there on, we've um, seen quite a lot of progress, I think. Um, there's a timeline here. Um, I, I said the formal beginning was it was in November 2018, and, and indeed it was, but it goes back beyond that. Um, when I arrived at the National Archives, my colleague, um, Alex Ritchie, who uh, had responsibility for business archives in, in particular, was, um, uh, was interested in this. And he and Peter Elliott of the RAF Museum um, had met and, and discussed this, and we'd put some notes together. Um, but it hadn't really, it hadn't really um, progressed much beyond an, an agreement that um, this was an area that, that we needed to, to consider. So you'll see the timeline from, from um, 2018. Um, the, uh, in 2020, we held a conference. Uh, we've produced some guidance. Um, they're a bit out of order here. The the, manu the aircraft manufacturer survey should be should be next. Um, then in 2021, after COVID, we held a very a very nice uh, webinar hosted by um, Rochester Avionics. Um, 2022, we began to formalise the structure, um, and in April last year, we had a, a Networks for Change grant from the National Archives. So essentially, I'm going to cover the period up to 2022, and then Lucy will take over for the um, uh, period from the securing of the Networks for Change grant. Um, so what I'm going to talk about really is um, 
uh, the foundation, um, the principles, and then some of the activities before we receive the, the, the grant. So I'll say something about the, the context. At the National Archives, there had been a pattern of um, initiatives to survey um, and provide guidance for specific areas of um, archives. Uh, this, this was inherited from something called the Royal Commission on Historical Manuscripts. So, um, for example, in 2010, there was a religious archive survey. Um, and I mentioned that in particular because I was recruited um, at, to the National Archives to follow up, um, follow up that. So having had a background in modern science archives, I was a natural candidate for a religious archives role. Um, transferable skills, I suppose. Um, there had also been um, uh, examples previously for um, work on archives relating to shipbuilding. Um, there had been a meeting of interested parties on maritime archives at the National Maritime Museum. Um, and there was a periodic reawakening of interest in more scientific and technological records. They didn't always go very far, um, but there was a, a background awareness that um, this is something that the National Archives should be interested in. There was also a developing strategic focus on using networks to support um, archives work. Um, I'm in a, a department called Archives Sector Development and in a team called Regional and Networks. And so our role is outward facing. We work with the archive sector, um, by which we mean not just recognize archive repositories, but essentially anyone holding, owning, um, providing access to archives. But it, it's, a sm it's a small team and it has to cover the whole of England. So the idea that uh, we would um, encourage and sometimes fund networks, both regional and subject based to support our work uh, was an established principle. So the Aviation and Aerospace Archives Initiative fitted very neatly into a, a strategic approach that had already been adopted. Um, and lastly, I should mention individual interest. Um, if I hadn't been an aircraft spotter in my um, early teens, uh, would this have happened? Possibly it would, but um, uh, it might not have happened so quickly. Um, it, I think it's good that there is a there is a role as um, the National Archives for, for individual enthusiasms. So the what, and this was, um, this could have been really quite tricky. Um, and at the same, what you the, the the dual problem of of um, actually defining what what it is, making it broad enough to um, include a wide range of um, bodies um, that have records of interest, but at the same time you don't want it so broad that uh, it, it can co potentially cover anything to do with the with, with things that fly. Um, so I, I came across this from an American source, and, and I remember at the meeting I, I, I sort of suggested this, and, and, and one, one person there sort of raised an eyebrow and said, um, that, that's American, isn't it? And I was gearing myself up for, <laughs> for reaction um, of, that we ought to use something British, but in fact, it was accepted um, uh, straight away. So that's that's the definition we've we've adopted. You'll see that um, it is to do. It is very much to do with um, uh, the things themselves. Um, so we could, for example, have branched branched out into uh, the, the social consequences of of aviation and aerospace, um, tourism, for example, or the role of aircraft in warfare. Um, and so while we're interested in um, warplanes, because they're, they're, they're aeroplanes, we're not, uh, our remit doesn't include looking at um, the operational 
role of, of aircraft. Um, perhaps it should, um, but we have to set a limit somewhere. So the why. Um, some of these um, are common to many areas of technology um, and industry. Um, there's no doubt um, that the, the development of aviation has transformed the world. Um, it, it's, it's incredibly important. Um, and also the UK for a time in the 20th century was um, a global leader in this. Um, produced many great advances, um, and that that is important to to, to to Britain. And and the National Archives has a responsibility to to um, document the um, heritage of 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 the UK. Um, but contemporary businesses are often not mindful of archives, and as I said, that goes way beyond um, aviation. Um, it's also, this area is also important for the heritage industry. There are a lot of aviation museums, a lot of transport, science, and technology museums have an interest in aviation um, and, and aerospace. Um, and the, this, this interest often um, means that it's the artifacts that come first. Um, they're usually in, in a museum's context, of course, uh, but, so therefore it's obvious that the, it's, it's, it's the objects, the, the artifacts, I should say, that are the focus, um, and the archives can sometimes be, be neglected. Um, and this, isn't, you, this is rarely due to, to, to um, in, intent, it's simply because um, uh, the volunteers and, and staff are geared up for museums, the museum's context. There's also a lot out there. Um, and when we were discussing this, um, people would say, um, oh, well, I know that the, 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 there's gonna be material over there. And I know that that you should try looking at, 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 um, at this place and asking what they've got. Um, but there was no single source of advice um, available to them. So that's that's the why. Um, so we sort of formulated um, what we did into a mission. This mission was formulated um, in two at the beginning of or the end of two thousand and twenty one, but it was formalizing what was already there. Um, and this this mission is now the, the the official one, and it appears on our on our website. Um, and you'll see there are four main strands. First of all is connection. And this is, this is very important. It, it's, it's a, it is a network um, and connecting a people, uh, providing a, a, a forum um, for them to, to, to get in touch and to discuss problems and to ask about things is, 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 is a major part of our role. Um, guidance, guidance is 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 a is also a, a crucial role that, that this um, uh, initiative is is playing. Um, disseminating intelligence about what there is, sort of um, trying to try to um, let people know about the richness of of material that that is out there, and hopefully encouraging those who have material who haven't really thought about. Um, it's it's research importance, encouraging them to to to, to get in touch with us um, and uh, tell us about what they've got, so we can make it, that information more widely available, um, and indeed general generally promoting um, these archives as as uh, fascinating in themselves, but also um, as I've hinted, they are tremendously important for um, for other areas of social history. Um, history of travel, history of tourism, um, uh, and, and changes in the, in the, particularly in the 20th century. The, um, 
the WHO, um, you'll see there, they, these are the organizations, um, most of the organizations represented on our steering group. I'll say a bit more about structure uh, uh, later. Um, so you'll see there's a, there's a mixture of heritage bodies, um, businesses, archives, um, organizations, museums, uh, professional um, bodies. And it, re it, 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 it reflects um, the sort of constituencies we're, we're trying to, to reach and those with it that can bring us um, benefits as well. Um, they, 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 it's a two-way process. Um, we, uh, we rely on um, members of the steering group to, 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 to offer us direction um, and, and we're offering um, them the things they, that, that are summed up in the mission. So uh, structure. Um, these, um, I'll start with the steering group because that's how we began. Um, it was an informal group um, and it was created through, through invitation. Um, people who were suggested who would be good to have on it uh, were invited and, and generally joined. Um, there was a strong feeling from the beginning that what was wanted was a informal, loose network. Um, obviously, you have to have some sort of structure. So we had, um, sub, we had some subcommittees uh, to work on particular areas. Um, and these had coordinators. Um, Though we didn't use the word, we didn't have any officers. We didn't have a constitution. When we did need to establish some structure, when we were awarded the Network for Change grant, um, we adopted a governing doc a governing document, not a constitution. And uh, this is a, a, a quite a quite a short document um, that that both provides some structure, but I hope keeps the essential informal unbureaucratic nature of the um, initiative alive so at the moment it, although it looks a little bit baroque um it is it works remarkably well um, we have a steering group we have at the moment um four subcommittees uh, three usually through two or three members of the steering group um, temporary officers um, for the period of the grant, we may decide to continue with them, we may not, um, and the coordinators. Um, and the officers are, are generally on subcommittees as well, so there's a big overlap. Um, so, um, the how. Um, this is the, the obviously the, the, the meat of the whole thing. Um, and as I, as I mentioned, there were uh, a number of strands we agreed on um, following the first meeting. One, the provision of guidance for custodian, the custodians of archival resources, and I'll say a bit more about that. Um, then the survey um, of uh, archives of UK aircraft manufacturing. Um, and then the whole thing about networking, communications, how do you tell people you're there? How do you tell people this is what you have to offer? Um, and uh, the big thing there is, is the conference to infinity and beyond. So I'm going to talk about um, each of these in turn. Um, the first, uh, the first lot thing I'm going to talk about is the guidance for custodians of archival resources. And it was prepared um, by my colleague, the National Archives, Dr. Mike Rogers, who spoke at this um, webinar about this time last year on the Land Transport Archives Network, which um, I, I sort of regard as a younger brother of the aviation initiative since it appeared afterwards and has, has, has followed many of its examples. Um, and I, I could talk about the philosophy of, of archival guidance here, but I, I won't. I'll just say that much of the guidance actually came originally from the Religious Archives Group guidance. 
It then was repurposed for the, the Aviation and Archives Initiative. Uh, there, there was a lot of work to, to revise it and bring it up to date. Um, it wasn't just a case of replacing the word bishop with um, aircraft manufacturer. Um, then that was repurposed for the Land Transport Archives Network. And then some of that has been repurposed back for the Religious Archives Group. So it's a sort of virtuous circle. Um, now, much of the guidance in the Religious Archives Group would have been perfectly adequate um, for um, custodians of, of, of aircraft, of archives relating to aircraft, but um, we wanted to make it clear that this was specific to this area, um, that we were thinking about the particular needs um, and interests of those with responsibility for um, aviation and aerospace archives. It was also written for the benefit of non-professionals. And this is crucial because so much of the heritage here is, um, is not in, uh, archi in, in recognised archives. It is in museums, um, with, still with businesses, um, in the hands of, of societies and researchers. Um, and so it's designed to be practical and pragmatic. The best must not be the enemy of the good, I suppose you could say. Um, so these are, this is a rough, um, uh, this, is a, this is the outline of the contents. Um, it includes um, old um, archival staples, such as cataloging and, and collections care, but also things like um, legal issues. There are lots of questions, for example, about how is data protection going to affect what we what we do. Um, digitization, um, uh, often very popular, but sometimes um, could have done with some professional um, guidance from the beginning. Um, the, uh, this section, um, uh, this, this part of our work is, is currently um, being revised um, in WordPress and it's, it's, it's looking a bit of a mess at the moment, I have to admit, so um, please bear with me. Um, so this is a, a, a piece from um, the uh, section six on collections care. Um, and you'll see it, it, it says that many of these things are, are known, known to you if you work in museums. Um, you know, dust is bad for, for both archives and objects um, and, and artifacts. Um, you need to think about um, handling techniques in both cases. Um, there are some specific actions relating to archives. Um, and, and here we've listed some of them. Um, um, yeah, and, and these are intended to be clear and accessible. So you know, if you've got elastic bands, for goodness sake, remove them. Um, there's also, as you see, cross-references to other sections of the guidance. Um, but it is all, as I said, intended to be a, a common sense approach um, and so, although we do recommend that wherever possible you use archival standard packaging, you know, it, it, it's expensive and we, we recognize that. So the second uh, strand I'm going to talk about um, is the um, guides to the archives of UK aircraft manufacturers. Um, this was um, created during the, um, shut, the, the, the COVID shutdown, and um, the vast bulk of the work was done by Alison um, Turton, um, who represents the Business Archives Council on the steering group. So, so immense thanks to, to her for her tremendous work. Um, and uh, the, the, as again, I've put a list of the, the, the structure of the contents. Uh, the, um, there's some uh, background information relating to, to um, British aircraft manufacturers, um, a, a, couple, a, a few shorter pieces, introductory pieces. Um, uh, it, was, it was lovely to get a piece on balloon and airship manufacturer because that was an area that, that, that we realized 
we'd, we'd overlooked initially. Um, uh, excellent piece on, on um, a, 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 a short history of aircraft manufacture. I did something on, on what you could find at the National Archives. Um, so I've, I've quickly one example, Bristol Aircraft, so you can see the sort of information you get. So we get a short, a short history. Um, you know, we're not writing a book here. Um, we make reference uh, to the public to publications you can find on it. Um, uh, there's also a list of principal and significant aircraft manufactured, which I've not, which I've cut out from this this slide because it, 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 it there's a lot of them. Um, so that provides a little a little bit of the context. Um, but what we're interested in really is is where are the records? Where are the archives that tell you about Bristol Aircraft Limited? Well, and one reason I've chosen this is that for Bristol Aircraft, there's a lot. Um, so uh, first of all, it lists those that are aerospace Bristol. You can see that these are mostly top level administrative um, documents, um, board meetings, committees, um, uh, and it goes up to the um, from, from the very early days of the company um, up, up to the 60s. Um, then we have um, records at the RAF Museum. And you'll see this is the, these are rather different. These are relating to specific aircraft um, mostly, plus some house magazines. Um, so th those are um, two of the, 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 probably the two largest of repositories. Um, but um, there are equivalent entries for BAE systems, National Aerospace Library, National Archives, the Science Museum Library and Archives, um, and uh, uh, Bristol Archives. So uh, there's, there's, there's a lot of information there. And the great thing about this guide is for once, it's all in one place. Um, it's a work in progress. It always will be, we hope. Uh, so we're um, including in the guide a request to tell us if you know the stuff that you know about that we've missed. Um, and this is, I should say, this guide is already on its second edition. Um, it, it's the, the been editions since the first, um, it, it was first put out. So um, if you have any information, um, go to the guide, have a look. If there's any information that you, that you see is missing, then please, please let us know. So the uh, conference um, to infinity and beyond. Um, this was po made possible because Tony, Tony Pilmer, my colleague in the, uh, Nas uh, the National um, Aerospace Library secured a grant from the Royal um, Aerospace Society uh, Foundation for, for a conference. Um, and this was held on the 12th of February, uh, 2020. Um, uh, we were, when we were running through this, these slides, uh, we sort of suddenly realized that, uh, uh, you know, if this had been scheduled for a month later, it would have been <laughs> a very different atmosphere. Um, but it was a great event. We had um, well over 100 uh, participants. Um, it was in a great venue. Uh, we had some excellent speakers, um, including Sir George White, uh, who brought the, the family connection with um, um, uh, the Brist Bristol um, Aviation, uh, the Bristol Aviation Link. Um, and then we had some fascinating case studies um, on various aspects of, of archives. Um, and as you can see, it, it was international with, with a presentation from a uh, remote presentation from Boeing. Um, uh, very, very good uh, activities at lunch, encouraging networking, um, conservation, um, but for, and, and we had um, Wessex Film Archive, um, film about uh, working in shadows about a Spitfire manufacturer during the, during the Second World War. And then, after lunch, um, 
something more about the the, the initiative itself, um, but also some more case studies showing um, various aspects of um, uh, aviation and aerospace archives, um, from dealing interacting with the public to um, uh, using it as a business, using these archives as a, as a business resource. Um, yeah, it was all made possible through through um, by Tony Pelmer, um, who's been a immense supporter of this um, participant and supporter of this initiative, um, and and the the enthusiasm of people in the sector. And I, I have to say, we weren't really prepared for for such a, a, a response, and it gave us tremendous momentum. Um, all sorts of links, connections were made, and everything looked really great. And then um, a month later, um, COVID struck. Um, I haven't done these things in, in strict chronological order because the surveying um, and the guidance were in some ways made possible by COVID. Um, uh, at the National Archives, our, this, our traditional pattern of working was completely um, knocked aside. Um, so Mike, had had some time actually to look at the guidance and work on it um and and, and Alison, if 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 there hadn't been been a lockdown she probably wouldn't have found all the time she needed to to work on the survey so it was although it was a tremendous shame in some ways i have to say it did give us a bit of time to do some work on things which we wouldn't otherwise have had that brings me to the network for change networks for change grants, um, which we uh, which we re we we, were, we, were, we received in April twenty twenty two, but uh, we, we obviously we'd applied for a few months before that, um, and it is at this stage that I will stop talking and stop sharing, and Lucy, I hope, will seamlessly take over. Thanks, Tim. Let's see how well this <laughs> this works. Fabulous. So hopefully you can see exactly the same slides we were just on, um, except for now you, you get to listen to me instead. Um, so as Tim mentioned, in April 2022, the initiative was awarded a Networks for Change grant. Um, a little bit about what that grant um, sort of was awarded for. Um, so the network for Change grant was awarded by the National Archives um, and it aims to support collaboration within existing archive networks um, at various stages of their sort of development and operation. So it might be um, to receive some assistance in sort of setting up a, a network um, or it might be sort of assistance with operating your network. Um, as Tim has covered the initiative um, when we applied we were already set up um, and the application was intended for us to um, to essentially assist with the the development of the initiative um, particularly to support sort of further collaboration and some of the aims of sort of um, disseminating information through through things like the survey um, so there were three, or there are, <laughs> because it's, it's ongoing, um, there's three strands to the Networks for Change project uh, within the initiative. Um, the first of those is a new survey and guidance, um, which is going to be on archival records that have been created by airline operators. The second is a website redesign. And the third is uh, a, another conference to, to follow up on the success um, of the first conference, albeit just with a, a sort of slight <laughs> delay between the two for, for obvious reasons. Um, so I'll go and um, sort of speak a little bit about each of those strands. Um, so I should at this point, I think, disclose that I am the chair of the subcommittee for the survey and guidance on 
records created by airline operators so I there is an element of bias in in, in my telling you a little bit about each of them um, so I will be starting with the airline operators survey and guide um, so Tim's mentioned the uh, the original guide uh, I suppose as it is now which um, was on archives created by aircraft manufacturers and following on from the success of that guide um, the initiative chose that the next guide would be archive records created by airline operators um, and the created by is a, a sort of important thing to sort of mention um, so it's records created by those operators rather than about those operators at this stage um, and so that's the companies that operated aircraft um, and flew particular routes. So, for example, um, British Airways are an airline operator. And this is particularly relevant um, due to the impact that the COVID pandemic had on the airline industry. Um, so the ability for the initiative to identify where records exist, the location of them, um, particularly as, as sort of the airline industry sort of recovers from the, the pandemic, um, it's really quite timely. So the, the process um, for the survey and the guide is going to be quite similar to the, the, the previous guide or the, the original guide. Um, so it's going to involve first of all, identifying where records exist. Um, so that's a, a sort of a, a, a desk-based um, sort of identification at the moment. Um, that's, um, that's sort of ongoing. And on this occasion, the grant is allowing us to appoint a freelance archivist who is going to be responsible for physically surveying records. Um, so the locations of records will be identified and then somebody will physically go and survey those to discover what they are, how much, ex you know, what their extent is, how much material is there, which dates does it cover and, and so on. Um, so that surveying will provide us with that information. It will also give us an idea of access arrangements and that information is going to be combined with contextual information about the airline itself. Um, and that will be added together to create the guide, which will, um, just like the original guide, will then be published online and promoted and made available for researchers to access. Um, so where are we at the moment with that process? Um, so we're currently, as I sort of mentioned, we're undertaking those sort of desk-based tasks. Um, so that's involving a number of different sort of project volunteers who are using their industry knowledge, um, publications, archive catalogues, um, and so on to identify where records exist. And that's happening ahead of us appointing a freelance archivist. And that the intention is that will allow the freelance archivist to focus on the physical survey. Um, we're also planning on being in touch with um, custodians of archive material to sort of see if they've got any uncatalogued material. So I mentioned that we've been searching archive catalogues, which in most cases only includes catalogued material. Um, and it isn't uncommon for archive services to have uncatalogued material or material that they they have sort of a, a high level um, catalogue entry for rather than sort of, sort of down to item level. Um, and we're aware that they may not have come back in our search results of archive catalogues. Um, we're also working on the formatting of the new guide. So what is it going to look like? Which material, uh, so, sorry, which information are we going to include? Um, so that's also ongoing. And what is coming up um, is going to be the appointment of a freelance or a consultant archivist, um, who, as I mentioned, is going to be doing the, the physical survey work. Um, the actual surveying is going to happen, uh, which is very, very exciting. Um, and then it's the completion of the guide as though it's it's just that, that sort of simpler piece of work, um, which essentially will be 
taking the contextual information and combining it with the results of the survey. Um, so I've sort of borrowed again from the, the original guide. Um, the intention is that the, the new guide will, will follow a, a fairly similar format um, in that it will provide um, information about the history of an airline. Um, airlines sometimes have sort of kind of quite, um, not necessarily complicated, but sort of, you know, various name changes and, and, and whatnot. Uh, there will also be a list of, of sort of relevant publications where they've been identified and then also um, the locations of, of records and, and a summary of those records as well. Uh, the second strand that I mentioned is, is the website redesign. So at the moment, um, on the screen at the moment, on the left hand side, uh, with a sort of the paper aeroplane banner at the top, um, that is a screenshot from the initiatives uh, main website. And that is where you can find the blog and some more information about the initiative. It's also where the guidance um, for the custodians of archive resource that Tim mentioned um, is published. And it's where the um sort of you know contact us that that sort of um information on the right hand side of the screen uh is the guide the original guide to the archives of aircraft manufacturers um at the moment these are two websites um so part of the website redesign will be to combine those hopefully into one website so there will be one home for the initiative and that will include all of that sort of information about the initiative itself and news and and so on but it will also then uh, include the guide well both guides <laughs> uh, in time as well as the guidance document um, and then the intention would be that that future work would all also be added there um, so the website is the the public sort of facing presentation of the initiative and its resources and um a part of the aim of the initiative is is to disseminate information so so um it'll be really fantastic to have everything in in one place um so the the website redesign strand is going to involve input from a professional um web site designer. Uh, the aim is to provide long term stability as well um, for the website and that's through sort of long term hosting and domain name um, changes as well. As I mentioned, the consolidation of the two sites into one um, and then sort of easy sort of easy navigation, better visibility for the, in the initiative as well. Uh, and then finally, the, the third strand of the Networks for Change grant was a conference, um, and that was to to really build on the momentum that that Tim mentioned that was achieved as a result of the the first conference in February 2020. Um, and there was a really great uh, mix of uh, sort of archive services, um, sort of people who sort of keep uh, archive records, sort of in other locations, academics, um, researchers. So the idea is that the new conference will also appeal to those audiences. So it will sort of appeal to both researchers and those who look after collections. Um, there will be a keynote speaker. It will be another fantastic opportunity for, for networking. Um, and it will also act as the launch event for the new guide at the moment. We're sort of penciling in autumn 2023 uh, for that, but um, definitely watch this space once once we've got um, uh, the actual sort of date and whatnot sort of firmed up. Um, so that was really the the sort of whistle stop <laughs> introduction to to what we're working on at the at the moment. Um, what I'm going to just do is pop up um, a slide which has got the two website addresses on it. Um, it's also got my email address and Tim's email address should you wish to be in touch with either of us. And there is also um, sort of a contact us function on the main initiative website.